<laughs> no, but yeah, man, I'm super excited for this. Like, my bad. Uh, it is going to tilt over just like the weight. But yeah, no, I'm super excited. Um, I was driving down here just like, you know, what's actually crazy, though, because I was coming up with questions, but I've been writing down questions for you and the wrestles since like six months ago. Like, damn. Like, okay, I this swear is gonna be good. <laughs> <laughs> no, for real, because like. I just, you know, the way my optimistic brain works is like, this was going to happen eventually. So that's it's crazy because like, I put it off like hella times. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really nervous no, to true, do interviews because I'd be like, I'm going to say something and y'all got me in 4K. Uh, and I'm we're going to nah, be able to take it back. back <laughs> this guy right here. As long as you're good friends with Alex, you'll be good. <laughs> All right, Alex, fuck with me. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, Alex, do you know where my phone is? Did I? I thought I gave it to you. Oh, no, it's right here. It's right here. My bad. Um, no, yeah, but I want to talk about your story because, yes, you know, we see this Tieta who's a beast and we see this Tieta who's, like, building good company and with LaRussell 24-7, you know, just helping him out however you can because I'm sure that lifestyle can get taxing and stuff. But I want to know the Tieta before she met LaRussell, too, because I think there's a lot of value in that Tieta, right? <laughs> yeah, like, what was, what was childhood like for you? Like, if you can just put it into a couple words, like, you know, what was it like for you just growing up? Um, so my childhood story is not very exciting. I don't really talk about it a lot. But um, childhood for me, in a few words, was, like, very lonely, um, difficult. And I feel like it really taught me how to handle adversity mm. and just be like, bruh, this life is not going to be easy. So... Whatever you make of it is what it's going to be. Yeah. And you learned that at a young age. I learned that very, very quickly. So, yeah. <laughs> so how did you land, you know, b being someone who obviously been through a bunch of stuff, how do you even land at a, like, prestigious school like UC Berkeley? Um, well, school honestly was really easy for me. I've always been, like, a very logical thinker. And, um, like, you could put a test in front of me. And if I have enough time to study for it, my goal is to get an A. So, you know, that makes school very easy. But um, honestly, I got into Berkeley because of my story. So uh, when I got into like my sophomore year, I switched schools and I got to a school that had a program called Upward Bound. And it's like a college prep program. So you have one period out of all of your classes that just kind of tells you about like colleges, what it takes to get in. Um, they help you study for the SAT, the ACT. And then in the summer, we take college classes, which helps us like you know, get our general ed out, out of the way. And then we visit, visit colleges um, one week out of the summer. So I spent a lot of time getting ready to go to college. And then when we wrote our personal statements and submitted our applications, I just told my story in the most, I really like writing. So yeah. I just told it in the most poetic way possible. So I felt like whoever read it was like, sheesh, <laughs> I'm gonna let her come here. <laughs> so yeah. What was that chat like? What what was like your biggest trial and tribulation? Um, I truly feel like it's yet to come. Okay, but um, definitely foster care. Like I went to foster care when I was five, and I didn't come out of foster care until I was, I think I was fourteen. Um, and by choice, I was like, either I'm gonna run away or you gonna let me go home. <laughs> so they was like, I right, bet you could just go home at that point. Mm. But um, yeah, up. Up until then, or up until, you know, whatever comes next, I feel like foster care was definitely the most difficult. Yeah, no, I definitely uh, talked about, I forgot who I talked about it with on the podcast too, but the foster care system is just not the best either. And, you know, maybe, definitely you not. know, firsthand <laughs> too, but, you know, do you feel like that kind of bred you to be like, you know, you know what, at the time, did you see school as like being your way out? For sure. For sure. That's why there's this clip that went viral of me being like, college is a scam. Um, <laughs> but I mean, college is a scam unless you want to be like a doctor or, you know, something that really requires you to get that education. But if you want to get into something like creative or, you know, like music or something, it's like, bro, just go do it. Your experience is going to get you a lot further. But um, yeah, I thought that college was going to be the way to like save my family and get us out of poverty. And I was like, you know, I don't know what I'm going to do with my life, but I know if I go to college, it'll give me some direction and it'll give me like a larger opening than you know where I got placed when I was born right and I mean that's kind of like the dream they sell out here in America right right it's like <laughs> right. you go four <laughs> to six years and like you said unless it's like one of those career paths where you really just have to learn like certain material 
Yeah, I, I agree. Because I dropped out. You know, I haven't made it yet, so I don't really like to talk about it. But I'm eventually going to be like, yeah, I'm going to call it a dropout. Like, quit playing, bro. <laughs> right. <Yeah. laughs> so, like, okay. But the part I really wanted to talk about, because I think it's, like, a huge pivotal point, which is I remember when we were chopping it up last time when I did the podcast with Russell, he had mentioned you came in the picture when he was at, at about 3,000 followers or so, right? So there's a bunch of questions that come to mind just by that one <laughs> fact. My question is, how did you reach out and, like, why? Like, what did you see? Like, you know what I'm saying? Because at that point, you don't really know La Russell was going to be La Russell, right? I knew it. I knew it. There was not a single doubt in my mind that he was going to be – I mean, he's going to be a lot more than he even is now, but there was no doubt in my mind that he was going to get here. And he was going to get here with or without me, but I wanted to help. <laughs> so I was like – I have to, you know, but um, at the time I was in A and R for Thizzler, mm. and I wasn't really A and Ring. I was actually doing mostly like social media stuff, a lot of like the slapper knob posts that you see or uh, YouTube uploads, and I don't even really remember what I was, was doing. That like but your it, first job out of college? Yeah, uh, yeah, that and like I worked at Chase Bank for a while yeah. <laughs> as a controller, <laughs> and uh, I did security. That's really what like allowed me to do what I do now. But um yeah, I was an AR and I wasn't really AR-ing, but I wanted to really badly. Like I love discovering new music and new artists and just putting a spotlight on people who are working really hard. So when I found him finally it was my first artist that I was like, bruh, have you guys seen him yet? And they were like, Yeah, we already know who he is. And I was like, you know who he is? Like what right. do you I've never seen you post about him or nothing, you know? And they were like, well, you know, his music doesn't really do well on our platform. And I was like, so? Like we we do we spotlight bay area artists like this is something that needs to be spotlighted and um i got him like a couple of posts maybe like one or two because i just kept being like this guy this guy this guy um <laughs> but it didn't really feel like they were as excited about him as i was or you know i don't know but um i also reached out to him to be like hey i want to help get you on this platform you know where are you from all this information so that way when i pitched it to them i would have like this thing that was like already complete and uh, he was like, not really, he didn't really care. He was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because he already knew what this was. And he knew that they weren't really like spotlighting what he was building. So he was like, I don't really care, you know, but sure, yeah. if you want to. Um, and I got him like maybe one or two posts. And then on one of the posts, you know, Thizzler doesn't have the most positive platform. They kind of, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so uh, on one of his posts, people were like saying negative stuff about him in the comments or whatever. And he had DM me and was like, bruh, and like sent me the post. And I was like, you know, some people just don't get it, whatever. Um, he's like, but yeah, I appreciate you helping me out. I actually have an album coming out soon. It was Marlon 7 at the time. He's like, you should come listen to it. Let's just chop game and, you know, whatever. So then we went, we hung out and it was like, bruh, I know you. And he's like, bruh, I know you. And it was like, all right, we're, we're going to do this. Well, we were kind of friends before, maybe like two, three months before. And then it was like, at that point, he's like, bruh, you have to help me. Like, I know what it's going to be when you help me because you're so like logical and you're so capable. And I know that once you know the music game as well as you could, we're out of here. So I think I met him like March, by like July. I was helping him with the, with all of his stuff and maybe like a month after that, I think maybe June I was helping him. And by July, Russ had seen his post on TikTok. He had a, like a viral post on TikTok. And then it was, we were out of there. Then Wallow posted him and everybody else posted him. And it was like, yeah. Damn. Was that like the 2020 freestyle? Yep. Which was crazy because the day that I, so originally he was posting all of his stuff on Instagram and Twitter, right? And he wasn't formatting it for TikTok. So he wasn't posting on TikTok. He's mm. like, I don't really care. And I was like, well, that's where I could help you at. You know, um, you're already doing everything. So I'll just format all your stuff for TikTok and I'll start posting what you've already posted on there. And my sister was at my house at the time and I was telling her about this guy. I'm like, bro, look at how raw he is. And I showed her a bunch of his videos. And I remember cutting that one that night and she helped me pick like the segment of the song that should go on there. And when we cut it, we were like, bro, this nigga is raw. Like, this is the one. And then I posted it and it went and it was like. You, when you know, you just know. Yeah. Damn. So it was like, yeah, you were, you were scouting him essentially, right? Like, that's crazy though because it's like you kept – because imagine you would have said like, all right, this, you're right. Let me just keep working under you and like following your philosophy, you know? Like, yeah. you didn't necessarily go around him, but you were just like, man, you see this guy, so you need to pour, you need to pour into him. So what do you think you kind of offer or were able to offer him? Was it literally just like – 
managing your social media or was it just was it other things that you were able to offer? I think it was really just everything that he couldn't get around to, I was willing to do. Because when you're only one person working so hard to do everything, some things just have to fall through the cracks. You know, like there's so many, you have like this list or like this tier of things that are important. And it's like, once you get down to that bottom tier of all these little tiny things, it's like, I, I'm not going to worry about getting to those because these things are so much more important. But I was there to be like, well, I'm going to get to all those little things and make sure they, they get done. Like I spent a week straight going through his entire catalog and uploading all of the lyrics to his songs and timing them out through a uh, distro kid to make sure that his lyrics were synced. So that way, when you play his song on Instagram or anywhere, you can read along to his, to his lyrics or you can post them and then you'll see them on Instagram. And it was right. like those little things that make a fan love a song or even know the lyrics to be able to rap them in a crowd. He couldn't get to, cause it's like, bro, I'm cutting, I'm shooting live sessions. I'm making music. I'm doing all these things. And it was like, well, I'm going to do those. Cause I know seven months, a year, three years from now, that's going to count for something. And now you see people mm. post his songs all the time and they have the time lyrics and things. And it's like those little things, they matter. But if you can't get to them because you're only one person, you need a Tieta or a team to do it. Yeah, <laughs> thanks. I've literally said it before. It's like, how can we get a Tieta? You know? <laughs> Shout out Alex. He's definitely like the closest <laughs> thing to it for sure. But no, yeah, it's like all that tedious, tedious stuff, right? It's like, you know, whatever, like you said, he's not able to get around to, but it really does matter, you know? And I think that just goes to show like your servant, your certain leadership, you know? Servant leadership, right? Yeah. Um, because it, you have to be selfless to be able to do something like what you're doing, right? Like, I mean, did you always, like, because right now, yeah, there is, like, Tieta and La Russell because you guys have, like, the free game Fridays. You have, like, all the content you're putting out. But was that, like, your intention going in or was it just, like, literally just helping this guy out? It was literally just to help. I actually initially didn't want to be on free game Friday. I never <laughs> wanted to be. That's why I've been so hesitant to even do interviews because it's like, I don't really want to be in front of the camera. I don't really want you to have be. so much game. though. You know? like. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I feel like it's more so of me denying my calling in a way. Like, um, I just, I just really want to be of service. I really want to help. Like even I've told the Russell multiple times, like, I don't want to, I never had the dream of like running my own business or starting my own company. I always thought that I would be like CEO of somebody else's company. So that way when I'm done and I'm, and I'm ready and I've, I've put in as much work as possible, I can just train the next person and then I can go lend my hand somewhere else. I don't ever want to be tied to only helping in one area of the world. So, so where does that servant leadership mindset come from? Um, I really feel like it's just me trying to be everything that I needed when I didn't have it. And I know what it feels like to not have what you need. So I try to be that for other people, sometimes to my own detriment. <laughs> no, yeah, that's, that's deep. That's yeah. so deep. Because I was just thinking about it today. It's, it goes along the lines of like, I'm, I'm going to be successful based off my insecurities type thing. Mm. You know, where it's yeah. like, man, I just, and Lil Russell, you know, he probably talks about it a lot through his music and stuff like that, but it's just like, yeah, all those insecurities that I have of like not being enough, you know, and I'm sure like when you're growing up through the foster care system or just like, you know, when you have certain childhoods that like you, that kind of gets ingrained in you of like, man, I constantly have to prove that I'm worth something in this world. Right. So like based off just like that core value, like there's a lot of people that are successful because of it. Like it's actually like kind of like part of a recipe. Yeah. I think um, success is it's a difficult way to describe what that is, though, because if you don't come to terms with why you're grinding so hard and what it is that you're chasing after, it might look like success on the outside to everybody else. But on the inside, you still feel empty because what you've been chasing and why you've been chasing it has been because of insecurities and not because you're full or fulfilled. You know, you're looking for something to fill you and nothing yeah. on the outside right. will ever fill you on the inside so yeah success is like such a it's such a outside perspective yeah. you know no it really 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 is because yeah if you okay so what is your definition of success um or what does success look like <laughs> for in Tieta's life at least for me success really looks like um everybody that i love being taken care of including myself and right now it's not there yet. In, in what ways, though? <laughs> uh, financially, 
spiritually, emotionally. I've just, I've witnessed the people that I love suffer through so many things that I, I just, I can't fix as much as I would like to. And as much as, you know, I think that getting a million dollars would do, it's like the money isn't what's going to fix everything. And, um, yeah, yeah. I just want to see a day where like everybody that I love and I care about is content. Like they don't need for anything. They might want for more, but they don't need for anything. Yeah, it's a difference. Damn. I had, I had something in, in <laughs> mind. I was going to say it. God. <laughs> um, oh, yeah, this is what I'm going to say. So have you found this, like, process very healing for you and just the ones around you, like, being able to build and create around, like, good company? Yeah, 100%. I think um, what drew me to a good company in the first place was the community, and it was something that I had always felt I didn't have in my life, especially like you grow up in the foster care system and I was five. So I spent the majority of my life alone. I mean, I was around a lot of people, but essentially I was alone and I didn't really feel like I had like a family that had my back, you know, or that I could lean on. But witnessing good company, it was like, wow, I want to be a part of something that feels like that. I don't really care about like, Mm -hmm. you know, what they're. I care about what they're building, of course, on the outside in terms of like the music part, but it was more so the family aspect of what they were building of like, we got each other's back regardless through thick and thin. And then when I got to actually witness it, it was like the way that everybody was pitching in in every way possible to make this thing happen for everybody was um, humbling and it was inspiring. And it was something that I knew I I needed to be a part of. And uh yeah, it's it's definitely been everything that I that I got to witness on the outside and more. Yeah, no, that's beautiful. And I think right now I'm reading a leadership book and it, the number one thing is just uh con- connection, right? Like if mm-hmm. you connect with your people and they know that and they feel it and it's genuine, they're gonna wanna do whatever for you. you right. Know? Cause how mm-hmm. important was like did you as far like aside of Lorso actually being a dope ass artist, how important was it for someone or for him to like really connect with you? Because for one, I've heard like within the music, maybe you're not necessarily like an artist, but I heard like within the music scene and industry, like being a female and working with like these artists is not easy. You right. know what I'm saying? There's, you know, it's just, <laughs> I don't know. There's definitely some shit out there. But yeah, how, how important was that? Like you being able to connect with Russell first? I think that was essential to the entire. We wouldn't have been able to build what we've built if we didn't have the connection that we share and if he didn't see me the way that he does and I didn't see him the way that I do, then I don't think any of this would have been possible the way that it has come into fruition. You know, Um, he really poured a lot into me and he made me see how capable I was. I mean, I've never really felt like I was, wasn't going to be something great. You know, like you just know as a kid, you, you look around and you're like, I'm not like everybody else. <laughs> right. and, and that's like, for some people that can feel like an attack on the, on them. But it's like, that's really how I felt. I knew that I was, that I was destined for more. And uh, he saw that in me and he was like, I'm going to, I'm going to give you every tool, everything that I know, everything that I possibly could help you with to become all that you can become in this. And as long as you want it, it's going to be here for you. And I'm, you don't work for me, you work with me and we're building this together and having somebody treat you like that, like their partner and not like their employee, <laughs> it changes everything about the way that you walk into the workspace, you know? Damn. That's some real <laughs> right there. No, for real. Like, cause I think the, the cliche, you know, mindset is just, Oh, I'm gonna hire you. So I'm going to tell you what to do. You know, right. it's like, come on, dude. Like, nah, these people are human too. And I think, mm-hmm. Even we were talking about my past, you know, career path, and I think that's what it was. It's like, okay, I'm going to bring you on my team, so I'm going to tell you what to do. You got to follow, but it's like, nah, like, you really got to take the time to connect with people and really understand what, like, this means to them, not what it means to you <laughs> or you or want, you know. Right. I don't know. But, yeah, no, that that's that's crazy. I, I really – I would. so so what is that? Because you mentioned, like, what you, what you guys understood, your guys' relationship. So from your perspective – what is that relationship? Is it just business partners? Is it friends? Is it both? That's my best friend right yeah. there. <laughs> no, that's, that's my best friend right there for sure. That's like, I know that if I need 
anything or if I just want to talk to somebody or hang out or need somebody's opinion or direction or guidance, like that's somebody that I deeply respect and admire. And uh, yeah, I know that he has my back. He knows I have his. Yeah, no, that's crucial. I wanted to talk about um, imposter syndrome because imposter syndrome, because it's like you obviously we just talked about like the beginning part. Now where you guys are at, you guys are obviously like grinding right now. Like I don't even know where to describe this, but I was literally <laughs> thinking in my mind, I was like, man, like how long are they going to go for? Like we need to appreciate you guys right now, in my opinion. Um, but have you ever struggled with like imposter <laughs> <laughs> imposter, <laughs> imposter syndrome right okay okay i almost lost it yeah have you ever shown with like imposter syndrome because like you have made it you know because i think a lot of times when th- good things happen to us we're almost like damn in the back of my mind do i even deserve this or like why me or something like that right so it's like do you struggle with that now that you're kind of there um not every day but sometimes and more so in the beginning than i do now um Because there was a lot that was built before I came. And I never wanted to take away from the contributions that everybody else put in. Like everybody saw, like he took off right after I came. But that was only possible because there was so much that was built beforehand that when he did take off, he was able to go. You know, some people have one moment and then they kind of fall off. But they had done so much work beforehand that when he did take off, there was no... There was no way he was going to fall off, you know, and that was because of all the work that everybody did before I showed up. So when he did take off and there was a lot of like, oh, Tia had helped and Tia did this. And it was like, yeah, I did. But I didn't I felt a bit like an imposter because I never wanted anybody to feel like. I was taking credit for the work that they did. Um, now, I don't really feel as much like an imposter because uh I work every day, all day, and I'm constantly helping. So my contributions feel like they're, you know, like worthwhile or like I've, you know, I've contributed as much as the next person in a sense, although like our contributions aren't to be compared. But right. that's how I felt in the beginning anyway. Um, so what kind of helps you stay grounded then of like, you know what, I do work for this and I'm supposed to be here. I guess doing it every day. I don't know. Those are kind of thoughts that are like, those are such like ego and and insecure thoughts. Mm -hmm. And I try not to linger in those too long. They're usually just fleeting things. And then it's like, all right, back to the work. Like who really cares who contributed more or who thinks I did what? It's like the work speaks for itself always. And that's for everybody who's helped and everybody who's done anything. So, I mean, what people think on the outside truly doesn't matter. It's, you know. And that's all that really matters. So imposter syndrome is like it only stems from you thinking about what other people might think about what you think or whatever. You know, it's such yeah, a no, it's such a rolling thought that it's like, I don't really care. Yeah, no fact. As long as you stay grounded every day and wake up and do what you got to do. Right. You're good. I'm going to do the work every day. So yeah. all the imposter this and who did what is like, I don't really care. Do you guys get a lot of outside noise, mm. especially because you guys have a huge audience, but. I feel like LaRussell does more than I do. It's crazy because once we did the free game Fridays and I started posting more content, my platform grew a mm-hmm. lot. And I saw LaRussell's, as LaRussell's platform has grown, he's gotten a lot of trolls and a lot of people who, the internet is such an interesting place, yeah, but man. people really will wake up and just spread hate. They'll wake up and they will just the first thing that they can think of that is negative or is going to bring somebody down, they will fix it on themselves to type it out and then send it. And that is beyond me. Yeah, um, literally. <laughs> but luckily, my platform and the people that have chosen to follow me have been extremely supportive and kind. And yeah, they don't even really like bug me <laughs> too much. I'm such a like. I'm a very like to myself kind of person. Like I like to, I don't like to go out. I like to stay in the house. I just like to work <laughs> and just, you know, get things done and stay with my people. Right. And uh, they don't really like even DM me or like bother me or ask me for anything. It's always just very like motivational and very like, we, we see you, we support you. And, and I love that for me. Cause 
I don't really uh, the other stuff. I'll just yeah. I'll just block you or I'll just delete my Instagram. I don't even need to hear it. <laughs> no, <laughs> like, we, no, 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 no. We need the game. We need the game. <laughs> so I just be like, I'm really happy that people have chosen to follow me and support me and be kind because I'm I try very hard to just be kind and giving and you know compassionate and I love that people have extended that to me as well. And it bre- it really breaks my heart when I see people treat La Russell that way because it's like. All he does is give and he's so kind and he's so genuine. And it's like, this is the one guy, the (laughs) one person in the world that I feel like we should really just let's just be kind to him. And people still choose not to. And it's like, well, you suck. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, it just goes to show, you know, like he's doing that that work. I mean, that basically like the reason why or the fact that people are saying all that is why we need LaRussell. You know what I'm saying? Is why we need you know, these podcasts to be able to heal these people because, like you said, it's just, like, energy that you're putting out there that I just don't understand either, like... It really baffles me. Like, I try to, like... I mean, it's not too hard to understand, but it honestly just makes me sad because it's, like, you hate yourself. You really hate yourself, and you're so miserable in your own skin that when you see something that is a light in this world, you have to try to dim it in some way. And that's so heartbreaking because you're going to be miserable your whole life. And putting this person down isn't going to make you feel any better. In fact, you you, now your day is like worse because it's like not only did you have these nasty thoughts, you went and spread them into the world. And that didn't come out of you and take less from you. It just it made that nastiness inside of you bigger. Like now you feel like, oh, yeah, I got it. And it's like you didn't, (laughs) though. You got yourself. (laughs) Right. Thanks. Yeah, that's really what it is. Exactly. No, I could definitely, yeah, we could talk about that for days. <laughs> but it's like, you know, right. it's all like just awareness, you know, conscious awareness, you know. And I think that's, like I said, I think that's the main goal, right? Because why do you post a free game? Or why did you guys come up with free game fighters? Was it just to literally put out a game? Yeah, I mean, we were having such legendary conversations like the Russell stock and gold cards and the pergola and all these things that came into fruition come from, you know, just those that that talk like that that game talk of like oh if we do this or we realize this and now if we do that then it's going to lead to this and we weren't sharing those moments or even allowing people to figure out how they happened we were just doing them and that's great like for people to witness but for the people who see something and then it causes motion in their life like there's some people who just watch greatness and then there's people who want to participate in greatness And the people who want to participate in it deserve to know how it happened. So then they can like these ideas happen because like Nipsey did his hundred dollar album, which sparked the thought in LaRussell's brain to do pay what you want shows. And then after we did pay what you want, we realized, oh, well, we could do offer base. And all these things happen because somebody chose to share their blueprint and what they did. And if we don't share what we did, then we won't be able to spark that idea in the next mind to do something even greater than what we could think of, you know? So it was like, we had to, it wasn't even a, like, but I think I, my bad, but I think people do have like that gate gatekeeping mindset of like game is so not told, you know? And that's unfortunate. <laughs> that's unfortunate. Cause it's like, personally, I feel like that comes from a capitalistic mindset of like, everything is for sale. And we need to just, you know, if you have something that's a value, then you need to sell it before you just give it for free. But the thing with that is like, well, not everybody is going to have the money to buy it. And I don't know, I think that's a whole other thing. But (laughs) that is like the root of like, where we're at in humanity right now. Like things don't need to, everything doesn't need to be sold. (laughs) Everything doesn't. And especially not game. It's like you learning all of these things that I know could never take away from what I'm doing. It could only enhance it. Imagine if everybody was like giving out game to everything. Like we would be so much further in technology and science and everything. If we chose to share knowledge instead of like gatekeep it and, you know, copyrighted and you can't use this thing because I thought of it and don't touch it. It's like, bruh, that idea isn't even yours. Right. It just came through you. It's mm. the universes <laughs> and the universe exists in all of us. So for you to try to gatekeep something is like, it doesn't really make a lot of sense because it was never yours to begin with. So, yeah, no. 
And I think you guys change, and that's what I love you about, about you guys, right? You guys change that narrative of like, man, we're just gonna, you know, because now more than ever, there's a bunch of content creators, you know. So it's right. like, but who's helping these guys out? You know, what agencies are gonna go and sign them? Not everyone is there yet to be able to be signed by an agency, but I think you know people like you guys who are doing it in real life and are doing it big, being able to give back, you know, paying your like due diligence in a way, you know. Yeah. Um, because long term, man, like. Like, me too. I, I'm following your guys' blueprint, I'm sure, a lot. Have you guys had, like, su success stories kind of reach out to you and be like, yo, Tieta, you know, this is what we've been doing? Yes, yes. We get to meet people all the time. Locksmith, who we just did the last free game yeah. Friday with at the Pergolo, told us, like, bruh, I followed your game, and it worked, and it helped <laughs> me. And we've had um, people come up to us constantly. People who do um, clothing, not even music, are like, I used what you said and I sold way more units than I've ever sold in my life because of what you said about ad targeting and reposting and all these things. And it's like, bro, it's it's working and we're having positive impact in people's lives. And that's really what counts. That's that was the whole purpose of like, bro, we have to share this game because we could change somebody's life and you don't have to like pay for it. And like when you have that kind of impact on people, it always comes back around. Like we see those people at shows which means that they are paying <laughs> right. to come see his shows, you know, or they donate or all these things. And it's like, you don't have to charge them for the game because when you impact somebody's life, you have them forever. They'll never forget about you. And they'll, they'll turn around and they'll support you too. And then you support them. And then, you know, it's just like a constant cycle of positive building. Yeah. Damn. That is <laughs> not, nah, you just said that so well, like you really did. Because it just changes everything, you know, that, like you said, like that capitalistic mindset of just like, it's going to be me. But in reality, like, I believe everything is an internal game anyways. You right. know what I'm saying? So it's like, you can't really take away someone else's. It really comes from a lack mindset. You think that there's only so much of it out there and I need to get as much of it as possible because if somebody has some of it, then that means I have less of it. You think that there's yeah. like a, a, a minimal amount of this thing out right. there and it's like the the universe is limitless and everything out here is limitless. So like you having especially knowledge, mm -hmm. it's, it's an intangible thing. We have we can't even access all the knowledge that's out there. So how dare we try to keep it from somebody else? It's like you keeping it from them is truly keeping it from yourself. Yeah, because then, like you said, you, you're able to build a bridge by just right. giving that out. La Russell sharing his ideas with me allowed us to ha end up with these grand ideas that we then get to execute on. It's always like, hey, I was thinking I would do this thing. And I'd be like, oh, if you did that, then we could do this. And he'd be like, damn, you're right. And then we do this. And then, you know, it's yeah, like it's all a trickle effect. It's all a trickle effect. So to not share knowledge is like you're you're keeping you're holding us all back, man. Yeah. Just share it. <laughs> no, that's true. That's true. And. Yeah, I think that's that universal currency that I always talk about, right? It's like, yeah, you're not just getting a... You're obviously going to make money through that, but, yeah, those are, like, little things that are always going to trickle. And you ne you're probably never going to know the actual end result of it, of, like, how much you made an impact. But right. I think, yeah, like you said, as long as we all kind of have that mindset, like... It's like what Tupac can, said. Like, hmm, I might not yeah, be the it. change. Okay. <laughs> that might not say? be the change, but I'm going to spark the mind that does change things. And that's yeah. why we have to do what we do. And we have to speak out and we have to share knowledge. We have to act on these ideas because you never know who's watching and you never know whose mind you're going to spark and what idea they're going to have because of the idea that you executed on. Yeah, no, that's facts. So like I said, I think you ever heard of the E-Myth? Mm -mm. Okay, so the E myth is the entrepreneur myth. That's me and Angelo got put onto that when we were in that in that company. Which is basically telling you that 95% of businesses fail within the first five years. Yep. Okay, I do know that. Yeah. And <laughs> a lot, you know, their their thing is it's a system, right? It's like a system thing. Like, you're not supposed to run the business. And I get it, but I still think it's both. I think it's, you can still do what you want to do, but you just got to have the right knowledge and information. Um, so essentially, like I said, I think more now than ever, there is content creators out there um who are starting off right they're, they're finding out man i like to paint on crocs i like to do whatever and now they're making content so what would you give like what type of advice would you give like the average i want to say average because no one's average but 
Um, <laughs> would you say someone who's like just starting off content creation that says, you know what, maybe this might be my thing. Like you think it is possible for everyone to post every day and like do all these things? I think it's possible for everybody to do it. I think that the results are not guaranteed. Like what you do has to be great. It has to be great in order for the system to work for you, right? Like you could be doing something every day and posting about it every day, but it's like stick figure drawings or something, which I mean, if you're doing stick figure drawings and you're telling a whole story, it could be exceptional, you know, but then <laughs> right. at that point you, you've taken stick figures to a new level. Right. But if you're doing the bare minimum and you're expecting grand results, then you know, you're, you're, you're playing a losing game in my opinion. Yeah. And some, some things out there might negate that. And we might see, you know, they have grand results and they're like, well, I barely did anything. But on average, I don't feel like that's what happens. But if you're working at your craft every day and you genuinely love it and you're sharing what you love and you're trying to be great and better all the time, I think that it's only a matter of time before greatness finds you, you know, because it's what you've been striving for and it's what you've been working at and, that when you put that amount of work in, it's it's guaranteed. There's no doubt about if it happens. It's only a matter of when. So that's what kind of helps you with that whole imposter syndrome thing. It's like <laughs> you know you did all these. You know? Yeah. And anybody who wants to be like a content creator or, you know, just share what they love and, and get paid to do it, you just have to, you really have to believe. You just, you genuinely just have to believe and you have to believe it more than anything else in the world, even if like the people around you don't support it or your friends or your family, or, you know, you only have three supporters and like that three is going to turn into six to 12 to 1200 soon. But you have to believe in order for them to believe. And as long as you believe then shit. Yeah. You know, it's funny, <laughs> like, and that might sound so easy or simple. Like I believe in myself, but no, like there's times where I'm literally, maybe not anymore or not as much anymore, but there was a time where, like, I just didn't want to post anything, and it would, like, I would literally sit there for, like, a whole day and just give myself reasons why this is not good enough, mm. you, you know? So, like, just giving that energy on into my post, like, it Ugh. obviously wasn't going to do good enough, right? you know? But I, I just got stuck there for a long time. I want to say maybe, like, a couple months of just, like, put even if I did put it out, I wouldn't want to look at it. Like, it would just be super nerve-wracking. Like, I don't know. What would you say to people like that? Was it just because, like, I was just thinking about it too much? I just wanted to like get there already because I think I, I think during my like whatever you want to call this my run or whatever I have had moments of like I want to get there and then like two three months later some good happens I'm like ah I definitely wasn't ready for that so. <laughs> I I definitely go through the same thing um I always feel really bad because people follow me and I don't really post a lot <laughs> I'll post every yeah, now and again more. Yeah. <laughs> right and I and I'm such a like you know post every day and do all these right. things and, and I don't even do it. I don't even follow my own advice but and, you do it for a good company so. yeah, yeah I do it for LaRussell yeah. and other but it's um I don't share that anxiety because it's not my thing you know it's not my right. face it's not my page and I'm the more that I think about it the more I'm realizing that I'm going into it with an expectation of a result or something. And that's what always keeps me from wanting to post because I'm like, oh, well, you know, if people don't love it or if, if it doesn't reach this amount of views or whatever, whatever is what holds you back in that moment from just clicking share is not real. And you have to you have to get past this expectation of outcome and just be like, well, I'm doing it because I love it. And then that's when you share it. If you can get to that that state of like, okay, well, do I love this thing that I'm about to share? And your answer is yes, then you share it. And everything else doesn't matter. But if you're like, well, I mean, it's it's okay, but I don't, I'm not really like a fan of it or I feel like this, then don't share it. And just keep going until you have something that you do love that you're like, no, I have to share this. And those are the only things that you should share anyway. If you're sitting there and you're like, well, you know, the lighting was kind of off or this is kind of boring. I wouldn't really watch it. Then it's like, then don't share that. People probably won't love it then. And you're going to get a result that, you know, you're you're not happy with because clearly you didn't love it when you went to post it. So why would you expect the rest of the world to? But if you have something and you're like, no, this has to go out and I do love it and you still don't share it, then that's that's something that you need to have a conversation with yourself about of like, OK, well, do I just not believe in myself? Do I not believe in what I'm doing? Do I not think that it's going to impact people or help people or, you know, whatever your goal is on why you're sharing it? Then you should start having those conversations and really get to the root of why 
you're feeling so much distress on, on just sharing yourself with the world. But um, if you don't love it, then don't share it. Yeah. No, I think that is true because sometimes, you know, there's that thing, quality over quantity, mm -hmm. but it's like both, you know, like right. um, put out a lot of good shit, you know. Right. <laughs> I noticed I don't post a lot, but I always post when I love it. Mm. And when I love it, like my page gets a lot of engagement because I only post when I love it. And I was doing these like life lately things. And those were kind of like my filler content. I didn't really love them, but I felt like I had to post something because I had this following of people who expected to see me. And I noticed that those didn't really get as much engagement. But when I posted something, I was like, nah, this is this is great. That's I have one. to share this. They <laughs> always do really well. And it just made me realize, like, it doesn't matter if I go six, seven weeks without posting. If when I choose to post something, it's great. It'll be well received because it's great. Damn. Yeah. Because, you know, not to throw any shade but it's like you're kind of saying the opposite of what you guys preach every day right which right. is like you post every day but it's like hold on uh, <laughs> if you have great shit to right, post every day right. if you're la russell post, post every and day my <laughs> thing is like even we took a step back if if you follow him actively and you watch then you probably notice like this year we don't post four times a day anymore or there might go days where we don't post anything and it's because we realized that we were putting out a lot of content that we didn't love we were so excited about, you know, just cutting it up and getting it out there. And then we would post something. We'd be like, I don't even love that. That didn't have to go up. And but we had so much that it's like, OK, now we can go back and we can kind of filter it out and figure out like, no, I love this. This has to get shared. But I mean, I think that that's like when you're creating so much content and you're just like, oh, I'm going to cut it up and I'm going to get it out there. You're bound to have some pieces that are like, oh, that probably shouldn't go. But you can only get to the point of posting every day if you're actually shooting con that much content. You know, like we do a rehearsal and we'll get 20, 30 songs that we love. And maybe only 15 of those should get posted, you know. You do an interview, you might get like 15, 10 pieces of content that's like, oh, that's a gem. And then you go through and you're like, okay, well, seven or eight of those is like really good and right. I should share them, you know. So it's just like you have to put up shots every day in order to – get enough content to shoot it, to share every day. And then you filter out that content after that. But I think the point still stands that you should only share what you love. Mm. And when you go to post it, it should be like, nah, this has to go up. And as long as you're there, you'd be all right. Yeah. So what is your guys' process uh, as far? Cause you're the, it's, is it safe to say you're the head of like the social media? Yeah. Okay. So what is your process of picking out a piece of content? Do you literally sit there with Larissa, watch it like you would watch film do you just say, uh, I already kind of know what Larissa likes, so I'm going to do it? Um, it's a mix. Okay. So, I mean, while I might do the majority of the content stuff, Larissa has his hand in everything. So sometimes he'll cut up the shows and he'll be like, these are the songs that I really loved. And he'll leave them in like YouTube format. And then I'll go through and sometimes he's just really excited. And he'll pick some that I'm like, ah, I don't really love them. And so I'll cut those out because there's right. like there's nothing wrong with having a second eye to be yeah, like, no, well, I didn't really balance. love it, you yeah, know. Yeah. So then I'll go through and then I'll create um, like portrait formatted ones that I really love. And then I'll send those off. We actually just uh, maybe like three months ago in May. I don't know what month we're in now, but we started. <laughs> <laughs> Man, I'm trying to be like that, bro. It don't matter what month. I'm chill. I'm living. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We uh, started working with this company called Edit Crew. And basically what you do is you submit your work to them through like a form and you tell them what edits you want on there. You tell them we only use them for uh, captions. And the reason we don't use like an AI thing is because it's like AI is cool, but you still have to go through and make sure that AI got the words right, right. and stuff, especially like for brows, songs. Right? It's, 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 exactly. The <laughs> it's the little things that people yeah, yeah, love, yeah. you know, and a computer just can't do that. And especially not at the mass scale that we do content. So we found this company and uh, you can basically you get like an editor that's assigned to you and you submit your work and then they will send it back to you through frame.io. I don't know if you're familiar with that. It's like, um, a, a yeah, it's a platform through Adobe and you're able to just put comments on like certain like time markers on there and be like, Oh, this word should oh, be this okay. or change this edit yeah, or whatever. Yeah. So yeah, it's made it like very seamless to work with an editing team. So then I'll send the, the clips back to them. I'll schedule them all through Asana, which is like a calendar based 
well, really, it's like a workspace for teams, but I just use it um, because it has a calendar where I can create tasks and I can move them around um, so that I, I put all the clips from whatever piece of content that we were on on whatever day of the week that it's scheduled for. And then I wait for them to send them back to me. And then once I get them back, I schedule them through Hootsuite and I put in my little caption and stuff. And then they go up See, on, on social media. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's crazy. You just gave us the whole system, really. Yeah. Um, I've been trying to figure out a way to like share that on social media so people can see the the process because it's very useful. Yeah. Yeah, Frame.io is definitely worth it, especially if you work with um, like an editor or an editing team of people. And it's like you guys are constantly, constantly setting edits back and forth and you're asking for like these little minute changes. That's like, <laughs> <Neither. bruh. laughs> if right. you could have just told me on which exact point, whatever time, like you didn't like this cut or whatever, it would be a lot easier. Yeah. Um, it's like another child. Everything is freaking monthly subscriptions now so it's another monthly subscription but i think that it's worth it right, if you're constantly investment. editing and you're not the one editing but you're asking somebody to change the edits it's like bruh this is gonna save all of us a yeah, lot of time tedious, the yeah. tedious things yeah yeah because we'll have like 16 minute medleys that they captioned if you do captions then you know 16 60, minutes worth of, of captions probably took you about two hours yeah because you have to you know do every single word so i can watch the full 16 minutes and every single thing that's wrong i can just put a little thing and we usually only end up with two versions of an edit if that yeah which is very useful in terms of editing <laughs> Damn. yeah that's that's a that's a whole process right there but i think like you said i think you know because at this time or at this point your guys is great as that's it, it's time, right? Like, you guys definitely want to have as much time as possible because, you know, I'm sure Larissa doesn't want to go caption the video at this yeah, point. Yeah, no, right? Larissa doesn't <laughs> caption. <laughs> He's, he'd rather put it out without captions. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Man, so let's talk about a little bit more about Tieta, though. Like, what is your schedule like? Cause I, like I said, I follow you on social media. I know you've been, you know, trying to hit the gym. <laughs> you've been going, yeah, you've been going consistent. I, 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 lo I love seeing people go to the gym because it's like when I'm not there, I'm like, fuck, like I need to go. It's that know? reminder, right? <laughs> yeah, it's like, yeah, you know. But yeah, how's that, how's that lifestyle been for you right now? Like what is the day in the life of Tieta in a sense, you know, if you can even do, because I know you're all over the place. Yeah, right? I mean, if we're not traveling, uh, which we probably travel about every 10 to 14 days, we're going somewhere new, um, lately anyway. But if we're not traveling, then I usually get up about like 7 a.m., I try to go at six, but you know, <laughs> that's rough. <laughs> I can never hit that like six o'clock. <laughs> but yeah, I'll get up around like seven. I try to get into the gym by eight and then I'll spend about an hour and a half in the gym. My goal is to be out by like nine, nine thirty. And then I'll shower. I'll eat. Um, if I have time, then I'll meal prep. It depends. Like if LaRussell's like we have something at noon or something, then I probably won't be able to meal prep. But if I can, I'll meal prep lunch and dinner. And then I head to La Russell's mom's house. We actually have a compound now. So we yeah. all live in the same place. Me, Millie, La Russell, and everybody. Yeah. So it's very useful if we're working at the house or if it's just like we're brainstorming or we're going to do like right. a, a visualizer or something that we can just link right yeah. there. But um, I'll head to La Russell's mom's place and then I'll usually just start editing. Like there's always an edit to be done or something to be scheduled or edits to go through. So that's my like daily checklist. Uh, Tope helps now with back end stuff. So he sends out gold card offers and he keeps like our viral content sheet updated and he does lyrics and a lot of the admin stuff that it was just like, I'm only one person. <laughs> and if I can't, the things that are most important is edits. Because people want to see shows that just happened. Right. They don't want to watch content from a last year year's ago, show. Yeah. And uh, there was a point in the year, maybe like February to January to like March, I was just burnt out. Like I didn't even touch Premiere. I just couldn't do it. <laughs> so I just kept rescheduling the things that we had to just go up because it was like, I can't. I, I'm, I'm tired. Yeah, just yeah I just needed a break. Um, so I've just kind of been playing catch up ever since then because we still were doing shows. We still had interviews and all of these things that needed to be done. So every day I'm just assigning something to somebody like Sarai helps with edits. Splash will help with edits and just trying to get all this content knocked out, honestly. Um, hang out with the kids. If they're there, we'll go play basketball, pickleball, tennis, eat. 
and then go home, chill out, probably play some video games, and then go to sleep and do it all over again. Oh, yeah, that sounds <laughs> alive for sure. So would you say you probably get majority of your work done between like noon and like 4 p.m.? Yeah. Um, if we get home by like 6 or 7, I'll probably start editing again. Like uh, if I spent the majority of my day editing, then I'll come home and I'll schedule because scheduling has to happen like every three days. Or if I spent the majority of my day scheduling, then I'll go home and I'll edit. But Yeah. Yeah, it's and a full time. When you were in that burnt out, because I think, you know, a lot of people who've chased greatness or gone for greatness or are great have at least gone through that at least once, like being burnt out. Yeah. What was La Russell's reaction and what made you like or what helped you get out of it? Uh, La Russell was also burnt out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we had just moved into the to the compound and there was just like a lot of in-person things you know, that my bad. To be well done. you know what's crazy is like out here you wouldn't be like i don't know like you know i follow you guys on a daily basis but i, I wouldn't know be able to know that <laughs> right because i was still scheduling things i us being burnt out and other people being burnt out might look a little different okay. like work was still getting done a lot of work was still getting done we were still doing shows we were still doing interviews i was still getting things scheduled but it was just we before the burnout our day would look a lot like it does now it would be like 8 a.m to 10 p.m. of just work whether it was me at the gym or editing or whatever brainstorming shoots or whatever so that can just be very taxing and during the burnout stage it was like I was just waking up and I would go sit in the grass or I would go to the park and I would read a book or we took mushrooms or you know it was just a lot of self-care and a lot of like, it's okay to not be on a thousand every single day. Right. And we had spent a year and a half on go. And it was like, this was bound to happen. Um, and he was just very like, bruh, it's cool. Like, we're good. We've done so much work. We're so far ahead that you can take as much time as you need. Right. And so we did. And it took like a lot longer than mentally I was comfortable with, but Every time I tried to get back to the work, I didn't love it. And mm -hmm. I wasn't excited to get to it. It was like, I have to do this. Right. And he always says, like, if you feel like that, then just don't do it. I don't ever, like, I don't want to do things that I don't want to do. And I don't want anybody on my team or anybody around me to feel like they have to do something that they don't want to do. Like, it'll get done. But I don't want you going into it with that energy. So I didn't. And it wasn't until, I don't know, I just kind of woke up one day and I was like, Let's get to that money. But yeah, I was just excited again. I don't know. You know, you just kind of snap out of it. You're like, you know what? This is a dream come true. Yeah. I'm I'm excited to to get to work, to create something, to to share something new with the world, to do something great again. We were getting back to like uh, the backyard shows and those are always just very revitalizing when you get to see in person what the impact that you've had and we get to talk to people and we had like an exceptional show in Seattle and honestly the beginning of the year I was really sick too like I physically was sick like I couldn't perform at m my best level because my body wasn't capable of it I couldn't even really go to the gym or anything and I go to the gym every day be because like of course I want to take care of my body because this is the only one that I have but also because it's kind of like a grounding time for me it's like a moment in the day that is just for me and it's literally for me you know um and I couldn't even go to the gym because I was really sick so yeah it was just it was it was tiring but yeah. you know you fight through it when you love something you always come back to it you always do there's like nothing could keep you from it when you love it so I knew I was gonna come back to it anyway yeah eventually <laughs> Every time I fell off, I came right back. <laughs> hey, that's low P, man. I've been on that song, Too Cold. I'm pushing on, man. Too Cold. <laughs> yeah, but no, yeah, that, that I think it's just such a real process that a lot of people go through, you know? It's like, because during those moments, how much was work in the back of your mind while you're, like, chilling out? Was Every it day. at all? Every, Every day. day. Every day. Because we were doing more shows and more interviews, and we have, like, this running list of content that's created. So that way we know like what to expect from people and if it's dropped to check for it or whatever. And it just kept growing and growing and nothing was being edited. Damn. That's why free game Friday yeah. stopped being shot. It was just, we were tired. Yeah, It was taxing and it was like more taxing 
to know that when you came back, it was going to be a lot yeah, of work <laughs> to yeah, be bro. done. <laughs> yeah, and that's honestly like, I think that's where procrastination stems from. It's like in your brain, you're like, oh, it's going to be so much when I get back to it. Yeah. And that's what kept keeping me from going back to it. And then eventually I was just like, all right, bro, it's, it's time to get back. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Time to jump back in. Yeah, no, I feel you because me too. I'm just like, you know, and like I said, when I say me too, it's like a lot of people, I'm sure, but you just have everything powered up and you know you got to get to it, whether, yeah. whatever it is. And it's like, ah, yeah, no, I think that's, that's very valuable. Um, I get to get to it. Yeah. Oh yeah, exactly. <laughs> I get to get to it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. No, I think at the end of the day, if you love something, you, you know, like, you know, it I'll may not treat, it. you know, you, and that's the thing, even if you do love something, you're not always actually going to love it. But you do love yeah. it. I don't there, know. There's some <laughs> stuff that's like, bro, that I'm not going to love this. Like, right. no, somebody might, but I don't. Like, there's certain aspects of it that you love, but it's okay to not love everything about it. But when you want to get it done, you're going to get it done. Ultimately, yeah. that's what it comes down to. Have you watched the Kanye documentary? A little bit of it. People are going to hate me, but I didn't really listen to Kanye. Mm, uh, interesting. <laughs> I I remember what's so funny. I remember when I was uh younger when the graduation album came out yeah. and I really liked uh Stronger. Okay. Yeah, I was yeah, like, yeah, this is that one. shit. But that was like the one song that I really loved. And the rest of the album I just didn't get. I don't think I just mentally wasn't ready for it and uh I just didn't relate. I grew up with like white people and Hispanic people and it just like I knew that I was black, but I wasn't really like immersed in the black oh, sure. experience. Mm. So there was just a lot of things that I just didn't relate to. Or I didn't understand. Um, after I got older and now I've heard the album and I'm like, <laughs> oh, my God, this is so great. I'm like realizing how great Kanye is. But yeah, I didn't. The reason I ask <laughs> if you do have some like spare time and you're trying to just just try it, you know, but I don't know. The reason why I ask is because it just kind of seems exactly what you guys got going on, except like back then, I'm sure it wasn't like the same thought process of like homie's going to record his process to be able to post it. Mm. But it became so valuable. We have. That's why we brought Splash onto the team. He's been documenting everything since earlier this year, maybe like Splash. January. Is he young young guy who holds his camera? Yeah. OK, OK. Yep. That's Flash. He's like 21 or yeah, he's maybe 22 <laughs> now. <laughs> yeah, I think he just turned 22. So it was like yeah. the idea of bringing him on. Uh, well, we went to do an interview and he was like, I shoot music videos. And he showed us one of his videos and it was really good. Like the he was he's just very, very creative. And uh, a few months went by. Laurel was like, yeah, I'm going to tap in with you, whatever. A few months went by. And we'd like never talk to him again, but we had another one of those legendary conversations and it was like, bro, somebody needs to be docking this. And usually it was me, but most of the time I'm in the conversation right. and I would forget to like set up the camera or something. Cause it's like, it, yeah. it just happened so organically. And I think we were in LA. It was right after we had, uh, got off. It was the same day. I think that we did like the Intuit deal or like the first time mm -hmm. we got involved in it. And we had just had like a long talk about like companies and brand deals and all this stuff. And it was like, nobody captured that. Mm. <laughs> and then we were like, never again. And I uh, I don't know when he did, but he said it was like super late at night. He just hit splash and was like, you still want to, you want to work? And he was like, hell yeah. He was like, all right, what are you doing tomorrow? And he's been working with us every day ever since. <laughs> and he's just kind of like a fly on the wall, just capturing the moment. Yeah, thing. he does. Um, He shot some of the visualizers like the visualizer in the back of the truck mm -hmm. for clarity he shot that um i let him shoot some of like the rehearsals and stuff i still love being on the camera so <laughs> it, i've been slow to give it up right. but yeah a lot of the creative stuff he'll be behind he helps uh shoot free game fridays when we do them but he vlogs everything so if you've seen the gctv vlogs that's all him mm. Yeah, he's great. Yeah. I love that no, kid. That's dope. So <laughs> maybe, you know, one more question about, like, GC. So GC, what, like, what, do you have, like, an official title there? Or is it just, there is no titles there? You just Nobody really it. has a title. Um, if we have to, like, when we go on the road, he'll usually just, like, mark me as, like, management or, like, social media or something. But, yeah, nobody really has a title. We kind of, everybody just does whatever needs to be done to get the job done. Do you think why, that's why it's working so well? Definitely, yeah. And nobody is, like, above or, 
you know, nobody's anybody's boss. Like I might delegate a lot of the stuff that I do. So people ask me questions because usually I do it, but like, yeah, I don't want to be anybody's boss. <laughs> <laughs> and Larissa doesn't either. It's like, right. bruh, if you want to be here and you want to help, right. here's what you can help with. If you don't want to help, cool. don't be here. <laughs> well, I mean, you can kick it, but like we're getting shit done. So. Right. <laughs> yeah. Damn. Is it is that constantly like you guys' life is just work? Yeah, but right it's now. not really like work. I don't know. Like it's it's so seamless. Yeah. We're really just hanging out every day honestly and sometimes we'll shoot content and sometimes we'll edit content and sometimes we won't do anything we'll just hang out all day I think that's so beautiful like, <laughs> no like for real because i think that's what freedom is right right doing what you want to do because even day. you know you can be making 100 grand 200 grand at a job and be miserable right and you're still not free so it's like you're you're right. saying you're either chilling with the homies making money Changing the world, creating content. It's like, come on, bro. Come the dream. On, bro. Yeah, no, for real. And I think, you know, nowadays, like, those are the companies that are going to thrive the most, you know? Yeah. Back in the day, it was, like, these big old industry companies that, like, have all this workforce and all this stuff. But, no, I mean, you guys are changing the narrative and you guys are giving people like us something to look at, you know? Yeah. Like, when I, when I did that podcast with Russell, I told him, I said, it's such a blessing seeing you guys alive, like doing this right now. (laughs) No, for real, because for one, obviously I'm able to, you know, ask you to come out here. But deep in that, when you leave here, you're going to keep posting. You're going to keep living your life. You're going to keep doing this, all that. And the only thing we can do is watch and learn, you know, and I think that's just super effective. And that's why I love social media and what you guys got going on. But. Yeah, we definitely appreciate you for Thank coming you. here. You're 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 a great soul. Like no, <laughs> for you. real. I know I know you definitely you know gone through your fair shares of life, but I think you take excuses from others. You know, it's like I went through foster care. You went through whatever you did. Mm-hmm. So it's like me. I'm like, bro. I you know how can I not? Or like I'm sure these guys or whoever listens to you, they're like, how can we not? You know. So yeah, I hope so. I appreciate you. <laughs> I know I gave you a book, but do you have any, like, book recommendations? I know you were talking about, what was it? A New Earth. Oh, But is there, like, one book that you would recommend to people of, like, because that's always a thing, right? People are like, I want to read. I just don't know what to read, so. Yeah. Um, Yeah, A New Earth by, I I don't know if it's Eckhart Tolle or Eckhart Tolle, but you'll know. (laughs) A New (laughs) Earth, If I feel like if you're there spiritually and you'll know, like, when you open up that book and you start reading it, you're going to be like, okay, I'm ready for this. Or I'm not quite ready for this. Maybe I'll come back to it. But that's definitely like my number one 10 out of 10 book. If you're like, I'm just now getting into reading, but I really want to start reading more. Chop Wood, Carry Water. 100 out of 10. It's a very light read and it just kind of teaches you the discipline that it takes for greatness. It's a really, really good book. I yeah. loved it. What this is the it best called? book. Chop, Chop Wood, Carry Water. Chop Wood, Carry Water. Wow. Yeah. Okay. It's about like a, a samurai who's like in training and he like wants to shoot his bow and arrow every day. And his uh, sensei is just like chop wood, carry water every day. We're going to chop wood and we're going to carry the water every day. We're going to chop wood and carry the water. And he just teaches him, you know, a lot of lessons about trying to rush to the finish line and how important it is to build um, a solid foundation to greatness. Because if you don't, when, once you get it, you're going to fumble it. You, you weren't ready for it. Damn. It's it's a really great book and it's a very light read. It's something you can read in like a couple of days. Got it. Okay. One last thing: Is there anyone, not necessarily that you look up to, but you like model your life after? Hmm. That's a good one. <laughs> uh, I've never really had like a somebody that I was like, oh my God, I want to be like them when I get older. I admire a lot of people, um, mostly people that I choose to be around. I admire, I really admire La Russell. Um, I have a really good friend, Taylor, that I admire. My friend, Bella, um, they're just really great spirits. This, uh, another one of my friends, Gabby. It's just, I, I meet people who are just so human and so kind and generous and loving and they just have a character about them that is undeniably bright. And those are the kind of people that I aspire to be like. Yeah. Those are the people you love to be around. <laughs> it's just all energy, you know? Right. So, yeah, no. I, we definitely get that vibe from you guys. Like, at the show, you know, there wasn't a ton of people there, you know, for whatever reason. But it just felt like, 
man, so contagious, no matter how many people were there, you know? <laughs> and it's just something you got to appreciate and you got to hold on to. And, you know, we try to just cultivate more of it, you know? Yeah. And Sarai. <sighs> so I, was, I was thinking about it. And Sarai. I can't forget about her. She works with us. Uh, Sarai. Yeah, I actually brought her That's on to the, Good the, Company. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I love her. I love that girl. She's great. <laughs> 10 out of 10. Yeah. What, what about her? Does <laughs> She's just very... Um, She's very loving and understanding and compassionate. I feel like she always knows what to say. Mm. She might not relate or have any have ever gone through it, but she just she listens very intently. And that's something like you ever talk to somebody and you can tell that they're not really they don't really care about what you're saying. They're like listening, but they're not really like absorbing or she's just very like empathetic and caring. And uh, you can tell like. It could have absolutely nothing to do with her. But in the moment that you guys are sharing together, she's like all in. She's <laughs> <laughs> Whatever it is, I'm here. I right. got you. Yeah, I love her. She's Shout like the, out to Rye. <laughs> right? She's the best. <laughs> absolutely. No, yeah. We, we appreciate you, Tieta. Like, this was a great pleasure. Hopefully, we can have another one in the near future. Yes. If you ever need anything from us, extended family, for sure. Thank you. Keep doing what you're doing. Appreciate you.